so the film famous for John Hughes, and I just want to talk about a, brief, a little brief history about um, genre films in the 80s. And for those who don't know genre, genre is a type of movie, and genres go through phases in culture. And I think it's interesting how, like in the 30s, you had musical comedies and screwball comedies in the wake of the Great Depression, um, film noir, or these existential films that dealt with the global conflicts of World War II. Um, also, the 1950s melodramas, the 80s, eight of the ten biggest films at the moment. At that moment, were the biggest gross, and even E.T. lasted for about ten years. Um, of course, is the era of synergism, Lucas and Spielberg, everything is all marketing, making money. The sequels become popular and profitable because people want to go back and enjoy those moments, re uh, kind of going back to the magic of the film. But this, what I find interesting about the 80s films, it's about the blockbuster, the blockbuster the genre in general. Because so, there's a formula involved in film, in genre films that make us understand. When we go to a horror movie, we understand what we're going to see. So, the popular genres, just a quick overview of the science fiction in the wake of CGI. Um, special effects are becoming more advanced. You have the horror films coming up in the 80s, kind of the second wave of, of the horror renaissance. You have these one-man army movies back in the day, these hard body movies that were very popular at the time, um, maybe a reflection of masculinity in the 1980s. You also have these um, Cold War films in the wake of Reaganism, and then time travel films. There were a lot of time travel films in the 1980s. I found that fascinating. As well as the rom-com becomes very popular, especially in the wake of single moms and joining the workforce. But this leads to the teen films. And what's interesting about the teen movies um, is why were they so popular? And a lot of it had to do with the rise of the malls, the rise of the multiplex, um, MTV becomes a very important factor, and the commercialization of youth culture. And you have these way with these youth films, like these Lost Children movies, famous because of the Spielberg films, all that Spielberg films were very child-centric, especially a movie like E.T. the Extraterrestrial, and eventually one he produced Goonies, and this is also like a homage for this, this, uh, this series of um, Stranger Things. But popular teen movies also have this wave of these, uh, these teen troubled films that reflect more on youth melodramas. Um, these films are much more grounded. Um, they tend to not be as comedic in nature. Um, and there's some gems here and some films I think are very popular at the time. Um, a movie like maybe like Lesson Zero, but movies like Bad Boys or even Reckless, which are kind of forgotten films, but I think they're hidden gems at the time. And even in the wake of the S.E. E. Hilton novels, The Outsiders, became a popular film, a film that gave birth to many superstars, like Tom Cruise, Patrick Swayze, and all of So this happens, though. In this wave in the early 80s, these sex comedies, these teen sex comedies, these early 80s teen sex comedies, and a lot of it had to do with the R rating. These films were explicit and exploitative in nature. They were gratuitous in nature. And even though there's some gems, these films seem to be a little empty, lack substance, but I think there's some exceptions to the rule like Fast Times at Richmond High, directed by Amy Heckwood, who also directed Clueless back in the 90s, and also gave birth to the director Cameron Crowe, who made other films later on, including Say Anything. But why do these movies fade away? And these fade away because of the censorship issues that were happening, um, protecting youth campaigns were, were campaigning around the country, um, we also had uh, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, Students Against Drunk Drivers, the National Drinking Age changes to 21. For those who don't know, drinking age back then was state by state law, it became national law. Also the Say No to Drugs campaign also factored in these changes, as well as the, uh, the rise of teenage pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases, as well as, as well as the AIDS awareness problem that was happening in the 80s. So all this kind of allowed these films to disappear, but I think the main thing was the new rating system. This is where the John Hughes factor comes in. Because in this rating system, it, you have this now in between, between PG and rated R. And a lot of it had to do with these two movies, um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and Gremlins. And these films were violent movies, but these films were kind of, they're, but they're not, there's no vulgarity, there's no nudity. And there was a lot of outcry because of the violence. And because of that, Spielberg, who was the producer, director for one of them, the producer for both, felt, you know, what's a quick solution? So they added the 13 to create that in-between is between PG and R. And I think that's fascinating because sometimes PG could be almost rated G-ish at times, and but sometimes you can flirt with the R rating. Like a movie like 16 Candles is almost one bad word away from becoming an R movie. 
Um, so this change made the films milder in content, uh, they're more family friendly, and this is the important thing, is that romance overtakes sexuality, and those other sex comedies, there was always thinking about losing your virginity, things of that nature, now romance becomes a more key theme. And with that, you have a way with these silly teen comedies. So this leads to the teen films that we just watched, the, um, the, uh, the Breakfast Club, and this is really uh, the, the history of teen films about the agony of adolescence. So The Breakfast Club, a film very linked to Generation X, for those who don't know, that's the American-born children of the 1965 to 1980, if you were to Google it, that could definitely change, and depending how you um, get it where it's at in terms of the age, uh, in terms of the years. But John Hughes was the voice of a lot of these films, even though he did write a lot of films like National Lampoon's Vacation and the Home Alone films. Um, these are the famous films, right? Sixteen Candles, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, The Breakfast Club, and he also produced some kind of wonderful and pretty in him. He was also the writer of those films. So, here we go. The Breakfast Club, a very unconventional film I mentioned earlier. Um, its use of minimalism was a very daring, bold move. And at the time, they weren't sure if it was going to be a big hit, and it was a sleeper hit. It made about $51 million, $1 million budget. And I think it's also famous because this famous song, Don't You Forget About Me, which was a byproduct of the MTV generation. Um, I think it's interesting in the MTV generation what happens. Like, a lot of musicals disappear in the 1980s, a lot of them in the wake of the soundtrack. The soundtrack becomes a dominant force in the industry. Um, for this film, um, this song was written directly for the film. And originally they wanted Brian Ferry from Roxy Music fame. For those who know the early alternative music scene, Roxy Music uh, was also famous for Brian Eno, who produced a lot of great albums in the 80s, like The Joshua Tree. But instead, they, they gave to uh, Simple Minds. And of course, it became not only the anthem of its time, but really the anthem of the 1980s in that generation. So Team X, I think it's interesting about this movie, you're dealing with alienation, you're dealing with the emotional struggles of youth, anger, anxiety, and of course, a lot of these youth films deal with the lack of freedom, right? they're not adults yet, they're still restricted of how they want to live their lives. But the teen action genre, if you will, was birth, born out of Catch the Ride, 1951, like the archetype of the rebel, and also finds its way with James Dean's uh, Rebel Without a Cause, and to some extent, um, even The Graduate in 1967 was a voice of the baby boomer generation. But the coming of age film through history, uh, through the 1980s, were popular, like E.T., The Karate Kid, you have Stand By Me, and one of my favorite films, Dead Poets Society, with the great Robin Williams. But what's unique about this coming of age film, normally what happens is you have a, usually a mentor, right, the Miyagi character, even an E.T., like E.T. does something selfless, right, to help Elliot. There's usually some type of paternal or maternal figure, something that's wise to guide, or sometimes it's like a road film or an individual traveling and finding their way, and they have multiple mentors. But in this film, we do not have really a mentor. They help themselves. So you do have this figure. We all know this guy. We know this person, right? We're yeah. familiar with him. Is he the antagonist in this movie? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely tension there. And he's a bullet. There are many antagonists, and there's an invisible wave of antagonists in this film. You could argue that they, the antagonists are within themselves, peer pressure, and even their parents. But I think what makes the movie special is this interdependent guidance for these characters. That they're the ones trying to figure it out themselves. This is like in the pre-era of the group therapy, um, before mental health became a, a modern term. This film was ahead of its time examining these issues. And I remember this when you were young, when you used to say you're too young to have problems. And this is a film that's examining and fleshing out that, yes, the youth does have problems. Depression, anxiety, alienation are the key issues here. And I think this is what makes John Hughes special, because he has an understanding of language. I think through language he knows the reciprocation dialogue and all the colloquialisms of language. And a lot of it is like, when he wrote the film, he was in his 20s, even though he filmed it at 35, um, he understood, I think there's a reason why we still quote these movies, because he understands the youth language. And I think that another key thing is the gestures of the characters. A lot of the scenes that you see, they're ad-libbing. Right? He just let them film and let that energy go back and forth. So peer pressure, suicide, abuse, bullying, these are the key themes of the film. But before I close, I just want to mention the characters. I think this is also what makes this film unique. You have 
these types, right? Claire's the princess, John's the rebel, Andrew's the jock, Allison is the outcast or misfit, Brian's the geek. But they're kind of these archetypes or stereotypes, but a deconstruction of stereotypes. At the time, if you're a stereotype, you kind of restrict it, right? You don't have much agency in your development as a character. But in this film, there's narrative and psychological depth to these characters. Um, they're, they're breaking down these ideas of types, and there's sensitivity, there's vulnerability in this character. I mean, everyone, when Anthony Michael cried, you guys felt it. The evolution of these characters, I think they're kind of neat, but I think there's some debate about Allison a little bit. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but I do have some reservations of the film. Some people have argued that it lacks diversity. Um, this is a film that's very regional to John Hughes. Um, there's always a lot of debate why the film this definitely caters to a much more middle class America. There are some negative slurs, there's bullying, at times a bit cliche. Also, it is an inappropriate moment, right, the harassment of Claire. A lot of people always found this, this is very out of place for the film. And this may be a film, maybe a product of its time. Um, the angst of this, the, the sign relationships are also maybe debatable. I get the juxtaposition of the characters. I think that's okay. But I think if the film was made now, you probably don't need to have that, that binary relationship. Maybe they just stay friends for the sake of being friends. And then you have the geek himself. Or he's the one that doesn't end up with anyone. But I think it's interesting that he becomes the voice of the group. So the makeover of Allison, now, there is a lot of controversy. Personally, Allie was beautiful the way she was. Yes. I don't know about you guys. I thought she was fine the way she is. She didn't need to go through all that. But there's also a lot of debate about, you know, maybe this is the gift to Claire. Claire's doing something selfless to Allison, so that's why she's doing it. There's a lot of debate over it, but I think now a lot of people feel like it, that also feels kind of odd right now in the 21st century. Especially with the idea of accepting who you are. It's a little bit contradicting to the story's theme. For some reason, this scene, so I could make it work, that this, uh, this scene was, uh, uh, John Hughes later on hated this scene. Uh, he thought he, he felt out of place. But I think it's maybe a part, maybe this is a fingerprint of John Hughes. John Hughes is still silly by nature, so I'm kind of happy he left it in there. Um, so what makes the movie very special? It has heart, it has soul, it humanizes its characters, it's genuine, it's honest, it has openness, it has empathy. Lots of empathy to these characters. And a lot of teen films are kind of restricted, but this film really fleshes out the identities of these characters. And of course, the self-awareness of these characters. They are aware of their vulnerabilities. They are aware of their shortcomings. And they're also very critical of each other. And that reciprocation of critiquing who they are, I think is a fascinating take about com a coming of age film. In the very beginning of the film, um, this quote, um, by, uh, by David Bowie was actually Ali Sheedy's idea. She loved this quote. This is from the, uh, from the song uh, Changes. And uh, as a surprise or as a gift, as a wink by John Hughes, he added it on for Ali. I think it's interesting because like, these children that you spit on as they try to change their worlds are immune to your consultations. They qu they're quite aware of what, what they're going through. And I think that self-awareness is also interesting because then you have this character. The very beginning shot I told you guys to look at, he was man of the year, and he's the janitor. And I think he has one of the best lines of the film. Bullshit, man. Come on, Vern. The kids have to change you have. And I think there's been an infinite war between generations that happens year, every 20 years. One generation feels the other generation is, you know, is no good or, or, or good for them. I don't want to start, I don't want to split any hairs or starting wars over here, but I think that the boomers had conflicts with the older generation, the great generation, you know, and, and so on. And so, millennial, Gen and Z, Gen X, and so forth. But I think it's, like, when it comes to peer pressure, when it comes to, I mean, that phase between child and adult is a very difficult phase. And I think it's fair to say that those problems that these students have, even me as a teacher, they don't really go, they only stay within that range. I think that, I think what's interesting about the, the Vern character, that he's just this, person that maybe he was deceived with the idea that people were going to like him. He's a bit of a narcissist, and I think that's the real big issue in terms of them. But after these movies are done, um, they kind of disappear. You definitely have some teen films like Clueless, and even American Pie is kind of a homage to those teen sex comedies. Even in the 2000s, you have Mean Girls, um, and even in the era of Euphoria. Um, these films kind of disappeared, I think, more so because they're probably now expressing these ideas of, of teen identity through social media. I want to close out here and open some questions. 
I love the movie Easy A. Easy A is about a young woman who is trying to find romance in high school. And she ends up realizing that she ends up finding her her her, uh, what's it, her utopia through 1980s films. And I remember there's a moment when she doesn't really, you know, she's kind of conflicted, she's kind of had enough of the real world, and she asks herself, whatever happened to Chivalry? Does it only exist in 80s films? I want John Cusack holding a boombox outside my window. I want to ride off on a lawnmower with Patrick Dempsey. I want to take him 16 candles winning outside the door for me. I want Judd Nelson thrusting his fist in the air because he knows he got me. See, this works. Yeah. <laughs> for once in my life, for once, I want my life to be an 80s movie. Thank you, guys. Ah, oh, that's good. Do you have any questions about the characters? Any reservations? Any of these connected? Whatever input I'm here for a few minutes. That was your high school.